Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a woman who is looking for a job and a man from a company that organizes cycling holidays. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello, Pembroke Cycling Holidays. Bob speaking. Oh, hello. I've seen your advert for people to lead cycle trips. Are you the right person to speak to? Yes, I am. Could I have your name, please? It's Margaret Smith. Are you looking for a permanent job, Margaret? No, temporary. I've got a permanent job starting in a few months' time, and I want to do something else until then. What work do you do? <laughs> this will probably sound crazy. I used to be a lawyer, and then I made a complete career change, and I'm going to be a doctor. I've just finished my training. Right. And have you had any experience of leading cycle trips? Yes, I've led several bike tours in Africa. The trip to India that I had arranged to lead next month has now been cancelled. So when I saw you were advertising for tour leaders, I decided to apply. OK. Now, we normally have two or three leaders on a trip, depending on the size of the group. Some tours are for very experienced cyclists, but we've got a tour coming up soon in Spain which is proving so popular we need an additional leader. It's a cycling holiday for families. Would that suit you? It certainly would. I enjoy working with children, and I probably need some more experience before I go on a really challenging trip. That tour includes several teenagers. Have you worked with that age group before? Yes. I'm a volunteer worker in a youth club where I help people to improve their cycling skills. Before that, I helped out in a cycling club where I taught beginners. Well, that's great. Now, the trip I mentioned is just for a fortnight, but there might be the possibility of leading other tours after that. Would that fit in with your plans? That'd be fine. I'll be free for five months. My job is due to start on October the 2nd, and I'm available from May the 1st until late September. Good. Now, is there anything I need to know about the food you eat? We usually have one or two people in the group who don't eat meat or have some sort of food allergy, so we're always very careful about that. Yes, I'm allergic to cheese. Would that be a problem? No, as long as we have enough notice, we can deal with that. That's great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. It sounds really interesting. Would you like me to fill in an application form? Yes, please. Where should I post it to? Could you send it to 27 Arbuthnot Place? A-R-B-U-T-H-N-O-T Place, Dumfries. And what's the postcode, please? DG74PH. Was that P Papa or B Bravo? P Papa. Got that. If you could return the application form by Friday this week, we can interview you on Tuesday next week. Say half past two? Would that be possible for you? Yes, it's fine. You're quite a long way from where I live, so I'll drive over on Monday. Should I bring anything to the interview? We'll have your application form, of course but we'll need to see any certificates you've got that are relevant in cycling, first aid or whatever. OK. And at the interview, 
We'd like to find out about your experience of being a tour guide. So, could you prepare a ten-minute talk about that, please? You don't need slides or any complicated equipment. Just some notes. Right. I'll start thinking about that straight away. Good. Well, we'll look forward to receiving your application form and we'll contact you to confirm the interview. Thanks very much. Thank you, Margaret. Goodbye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a radio interview about an upcoming fair. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 14. Good afternoon and welcome to City Hour, the radio show that brings you all the latest information about events in and around our city. Today, we have with us Cynthia Smith, who is heading up this year's City Fair. Cynthia, would you start by giving us some of the basic information about the fair? Where will it take place this year? I'm glad you asked that question, because I know most people will be expecting the fair to be at the fairgrounds as usual, but we've had to change the location this year due to some construction work. You know, they're building the new high school in that neighbourhood, and they've been using the fairgrounds as a place to store construction materials. So we've moved the fair to City Park, which I think is a wonderful location. Yes, that will be a great place for the fair. I understand that the fair begins on Friday morning with a special opening event. Actually, it won't begin until that evening, but you're right about the special event. Traditionally, we've begun with a parade, but this year our opening event will be a special dance performance. And the most exciting part is that the mayor will be one of the dancers. The mayor is a woman of many talents. Cynthia, could you tell our listeners about the price of admission? What will it cost to attend the fair? We're trying to keep the price down as much as possible. A three-day pass is just $25.00. Or you can buy a Saturday or Sunday only pass for $15. The opening event on Friday, the dance performance, doesn't cost anything to attend and we're hoping a lot of people will come to watch that. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Could you tell us about some of the events planned for Saturday and Sunday, the main days of the fair? We have a lot of exciting things planned. There are a number of events especially for children, including a clown show on Saturday afternoon. On Saturday evening, we've got an event that can be enjoyed by the whole family, a concert by the lake. I'm sure that will be a popular event. Is there anything special planned for Sunday? Yes, a really fun event. And we hope a lot of people will participate. There'll be a singing in the afternoon, it's open to everyone at no charge. It doesn't matter whether you're an experienced singer or not. If you've always dreamed of singing on stage, this is your chance. That sounds like a lot of fun. I think it will be. I'd also like your listeners to know that besides the special events I've mentioned, there will be things taking place all weekend. For example, at the food court, international food will be served. You'll be able to sample dishes from all around the world. There will also be special games for children at different locations around the fair.
Will there be things people can buy, souvenirs, anything like that? We have a large area set aside where there will be crafts for sale. This will be an opportunity to buy many lovely handmade things and to get to know some of our local artists and craftspeople as well. It sounds like there will be a lot of fun for everyone at this year's fair. Thank you for sharing the information with us, Cynthia. Thank you for inviting me. Inviting me. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two students, called Jack and Alice, discussing food labels that give information on the nutritional value of foods. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. I've still got loads to do for our report on nutritional food labels. Me too. What did you learn from doing the project about your own shopping habits? Well, I've always had to check labels for traces of peanuts in everything I eat because of my allergy. But beyond that, I've never really been concerned enough to check how healthy a product is. This project has actually taught me to read the labels much more carefully. I tended to believe claims on packaging, like low in fat. But I now realise that the healthy yoghurt I've bought for years is full of sugar and that it's actually quite high in calories. Mm. Ready meals are the worst. Comparing the labels on supermarket pizzas was a real eye-opener. Did you have any idea how many calories they contain? I was amazed. Yes, because unless you read the label really carefully, you wouldn't know that the nutritional values given are for half a pizza. When most people eat the whole pizza. Not exactly transparent, is it? Not at all. But I expect it won't stop you from buying pizza. Probably not, no. I thought comparing the different labelling systems used by food manufacturers was interesting. I think the kind of labelling system used makes a big difference. Which one did you prefer? I like the traditional daily value system best, the one which tells you what proportion of your required daily intake of each ingredient the product contains. I'm not sure it's the easiest for people to use, but at least you get the full story. I like to know all the ingredients in a product, not just how much fat, salt and sugar they contain. But it's good supermarkets have been making an effort to provide reliable information for customers. Yes. There just needs to be more consistency between labelling systems used by different supermarkets in terms of portion sizes, etc. Hmm. The labels on the different brands of chicken flavour crisps were quite revealing too, weren't they? Yeah. I don't understand how they can get away with calling them chicken flavour when they only contain artificial additives. I know. I'd at least have expected them to contain a small percentage of real chicken. Absolutely. 
I think having nutritional food labelling has been a good idea, don't you? I think it will change people's behaviour and stop mothers, in particular, buying the wrong things. But didn't that study kind of prove the opposite? People didn't necessarily stop buying unhealthy products. They only said that might be the case. Those findings weren't that conclusive, and it was quite a small-scale study. I think more research has to be done. Yes, I think you're probably right. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. What do you think of the traffic light system? I think supermarkets like the idea of having a colour-coded system, red, orange or green, for levels of fat, sugar and salt in a product. But it's not been adopted universally, and not on all products. Why do you suppose that is? Pressure from the food manufacturers. Hardly surprising that some of them are opposed to flagging up how unhealthy their products are. I'd have thought it would have been compulsory. It seems ridiculous it isn't. I know. And what I couldn't get over is the fact that it was brought in without enough consultation. A lot of experts had deep reservations about it. That is a bit weird. I suppose there's an argument for doing the research now when consumers are familiar with this system. Yeah, maybe. The participants in the survey were quite positive about the traffic light system. Hmm. But I don't think they targeted the right people. They should have focused on people with low literacy levels because these labels are designed to be accessible to them. Yeah. But it's good to get feedback from all socio-economic groups and there wasn't much variation in their responses. No. But if they hadn't interviewed participants face-to-face, -face, they could have used a much bigger sample size. I wonder why they chose that method. Dunno. How were they selected? Did they volunteer or were they approached? I think they volunteered. The thing that wasn't stated was how often they bought packaged food. All we know is how frequently they use the supermarket. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a lecture about the black bear. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 30 to 40. The black bear, or Ursus americanus, has a wide range inhabiting forested areas of North America, including Canada, the United States, and parts of northern Mexico. Black bears are omnivores, getting their nutrition from a wide variety of plants and animals. The particular foods any one bear eats depends on what's available in the area where that bear lives, as well as on the season of the year. 
Generally speaking, plant foods make up 90% of the bear's diet. The rest of its meals consist of animal foods, such as insects and fish. Bears have a relatively long gestation period. Mating takes place in the spring or early summer, but bear cubs aren't born until the following winter. Usually, two cubs are born at a time, although some litters may have as many as five cubs. Bear cubs are dependent on their mother and may stay with her for close to two years. Wild black bears can live as long as 25 years. They've lived for as long as 30 years or more in captivity. Much of the black bear's range coincides with the range of its close cousin, the grizzly bear. Although these bears are somewhat similar in appearance and habits, it isn't difficult to tell the difference between them. Colour isn't necessarily a distinguishing characteristic, as both species of bears occur in a range of colours from almost blonde to dark brown or black. Many black bears, however, have a patch of fur on their chests that's lighter in colour than the rest of their fur. Grizzly bears don't have this patch. Size isn't always a distinguishing feature either, although grizzly bears are usually heavier with an average weight of 225 kilos. Black bears average 140 kilos in weight. Grizzly bears spend time digging in the ground for roots and tubers that make up part of their diet. The large muscles they need for this give them a, give them a distinct shoulder hump. This hump is absent in black bears which don't do the same kind of digging. The shape of the face and ears is also different in each species of bear. Grizzly bears have a depression between the eyes and nose and short round ears. Black bears, on the other hand, have a straighter profile and longer, more pointed ears. Grizzly bears are known for their fearsome long, sharp claws. Black bears have shorter claws, which are better suited for climbing trees. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. All right, folks, grab your pens and notebooks because today I'm diving deep into the secrets of acing Eelts writing task two. Now, if you're aiming for a high band score, listen up. First things first, understand the question. Read it twice if you have to. You need to grasp exactly what it's asking for. Misunderstanding the question can cost you precious points. All right, once you've got the question down, it's time to plan. I know planning can feel like a waste of time, but trust me, it's not. Spend about five minutes brainstorming and outlining your essay. This will keep your writing focused and structured. Start with noting down your main points and supporting details. Remember, coherence and cohesion are key. Next up, let's talk about introductions. Keep it simple and direct. Paraphrase the question and state your opinion clearly if the task asks for it. Don't waste your word count on fancy openings, just get to the point. Now, onto the body paragraphs. Aim for two to three strong paragraphs. Each should have a clear main idea supported by examples or reasons. Use linking words like firstly, moreover, in addition to create a logical flow. This not only makes your essay easier to read, but also boosts your coherence score. Let's not forget about vocabulary and grammar. Use a range of vocabulary, but make sure it's appropriate to the topic. 
don't throw in complex words just to impress. They can do more harm than good if used incorrectly. Also, vary your sentence structures. Mix simple, compound and complex sentences to show your range. All right, let's move to conclusions. Keep it short and sweet, Todd. Summarize your main points and restate your opinion if needed. Don't introduce any new ideas here. A strong conclusion can leave a lasting impression on the examiner. A quick word on time management. You've got 40 minutes for task two, so use it wisely. Spend the first five minutes planning, about 30 minutes writing, and the last five minutes revising. Check for any errors in grammar, spelling, and punctuation. These little mistakes can add up and cost you marks. Finally, practice, practice, practice. The more you write, the better you get. Try writing essays on different topics and get feedback if you can. There are plenty of resources online, so take advantage of them. And there you have it, folks. Follow these tips, put in the effort, and you'll be well on your way to mastering EELTS Writing Task 2. Good luck and happy studying.